Well, it's that time of year when you're going to be taking a rough idea of a topic you're interested in and turning it into an experiment or a study. In our case, you'll be designing an ex observational study because we can't remove animals from the refuge. But for my example today, I'm going to use an experiment we do this time of year, the pH and buffers lab. In the past, this lab has been more of a guided exploration. This year, I want to generate quantitative data that I can test. That's the great thing about designing your own experiment once you understand statistics. You can build in experimental methods that complement the analytical methods you think will best suit your question. Questions in this case will be things like, what are buffers? Which solutions are known to act as buffers? And do biological buffers perform as well as chemical buffers? Your questions act as a framework for the procedures you, can, you choose and the data you collect. When you write your proposals, you'll generate questions both simple and hopefully complex. Do some research to create a short annotated bibliography addressing your question, and then write null and alternative hypotheses, and then plan out your materials and your procedures. That's all going into the proposal. When you conduct the pH lab, the data that you'll gather is going to be using a number of solutions so that you can ask a variety of questions. Milk, gelatin, potato extract, chemical buffers, and tap water will be used. I'm going to use blood plasma in my example since it's a known biological buffer and often used in examples in textbooks, but it's obviously not something we can get easy access to in our classroom lab, so you'll need to consider a different biological solution as your IV. It pays to know some things before you write your hypotheses. Actually, it always pays to do a little prep before you start anything new. Research what you don't know and gather all the facts together. So here's what I know. I know that blood buffering is essential to the folding of hemoglobin and the delivery of oxygen to cells. I know water always exists as some H3O positive ions and some OH negative ones, but I don't think it acts as a buffer since I've added acid to water before and the dilution still behaves like an acid. So my informed expectation for the lab is that blood plasma will resist changes in pH and water will not. In other words, it's going to take a lot more acid to make the pH of blood plasma drop to a certain level than it will to get water to that same level. So let's make sure we're clear on the details of the pH lab. My IV is the biological solution I choose that's going to be milk, potato, or gelatin for you, and it's blood plasma in my example, with water as the control group. These are categorical variables. My DV is the number of drops of acid or base that it will take to reach a certain pH threshold. This is a quantitative variable, and it has a unit of measure. You should always include units and labels. If you don't, I'm going to assume something ridiculous. Your alternative hypothesis is going to state the relationship you expect to see between the variables. Mine would be something like, if acid is added to both tap water and blood plasma until a pH of 5 is reached, blood plasma will require more drops of acid than water because it has the ability to buffer and resist changes in pH. My alternative hypothesis is predicting a trend that I expect to see, and it's giving the rationale behind that expectation. Independent variables are manipulated by the scientist, I change my IV, and the dependent variables are measured and change in response to the IV. Sometimes these are called responding variables. And so that's going to tell you that my number of drops will be measured and will depend on the solution that I choose to test. So milk may not behave quite like potato extract or gelatin does. In the next video segment, I'm going to talk more about the statistics that go along with this lab.